Hi, this is Ray Moss Older. We're in the 19th chapter of No Surrender by Chris Edmonds and Douglas Century. Paul Stern couldn't stop thinking about the boy without a face. Back in the early hours of the fighting in the Ardennes, on the afternoon of December 16th, Paul had been scrambling among the bodies of the wounded, the dying and the dead. He'd rushed to the side of a young GI who had stepped on a German mine. The soldier was only 19 years old, just like Paul and the other field medics. Paul tried his best to treat him, but the kid's face was blown off. His face was gone but he was somehow still alive. Paul had never felt so powerless as a combat medic. How was a young GI even breathing? How was he conscious? All Paul could do was sprinkle a little, little sulfonamide on the wounds where the boy's face should have been. Paul's unit had no penicillin or morphine. Bobby, yes. That was the boy's name. Paul was sure he hadn't lived more than a day. Paul had prayed for him and had gotten him evacuated to the rear lines, but the lead picture stayed in his mind, haunting him throughout his nights in Stalag, IXA. A day never went by when Paul didn't think about Bobby. And a day never went by when he didn't think about the young lieutenant and the other soldiers standing by a pillbox in the Siegfried line. The first days of the fighting in the Ardennes, a frightened looking lieutenant had approached Paul for advice in a rest area. He was a medical administrative officer, had never seen a moment of combat had never fired a gun in battle, and had been promoted to infantry leader without having had much training. Sten, he said, you've been around quite a bit. I don't know a thing about combat. Can you help me? What do I do? Paul was taken aback. What could he possibly tell the lieutenant? All I can tell you is to keep your butt as close to the ground as possible and pray like hell. It's the only thing you can do when you're under fire, sir. Just moments later, he looked up and saw three GIs gathered around the entrance to a German pillbox. They were standing there and leaning right up against the pillbox, relaxed, smoking cigarettes completely exposed. Paul knew there were Germans inside the pillbox, and he sprinted as fast as he could, some 50 yards as soon as Paul got close, panting. He recognized the same green lieutenant who had asked for his advice. That lieutenant and the two other soldiers were sitting ducks. You guys got to move, Paul shouted pulling the three men to the south side of the pillbox. Concrete so thick that no bullets or shrapnel could penetrate it. He pulled them out of the way just in time. Moments later, a German soldier inside the pillbox opened a slit in the door and tossed out a hand grenade. It exploded right in the spot where the lieutenant and soldiers had been standing. They recoiled from the blast, unhurt behind the concrete wall, and they hurried back to the safety of the battalion aid station. The lieutenant wasted no time in telling Paul's commanding officer about the incident. The next morning, Paul was promoted in the field, bumped up from private to corporal, a non-commissioned officer. He also received the Bronze Star for heroism. Lying in the barracks in Stalag, 
IXA with the other non-coms. Paul fully grasped what had happened at that German pillbox. He'd saved three men's lives, and by doing so without realizing it, they might have saved his. He didn't know what lay in store for the Jewish privates and privates first class back at Bad Orb, but at least as a non-com now, Corporal Paul Stern could be fairly certain he wouldn't be separated from his close friend, Staff Sergeant Lester Tannenbaum and Corporal Skip Friedman. Paul would never forget that lesson. Whenever you help people, he often said later, you help yourself. Paul and Skip repeatedly lifted each other's spirits even as they saw their bodies deteriorate with starvation. Several times Paul, ever the optimist, made a promise to Skip that they would be free men by Passover that spring. Surely could not have been a coincidence that Paul's Hebrew name was Peshach, or Passover. Paul and I have found a way of keeping each other up in comparison to the other GIs, Skip later recalled. He assured me we would be eating matzah by Passover. Paul was a young man who never lost faith. He'd already witnessed several miraculous episodes during his service in Europe. The days before the horrific Battle of Hurtgen Forest in late October, Paul had arrived in the ancient city of Aachen, the first German city to be captured by the Allies. And on Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, an extraordinary ceremony had been arranged. Paul gathered with more than 50 other Jewish GIs from various combat units to conduct the Jewish services. Several of the men draped their shoulders with prayer shawls. Many, like Paul, remained in full combat gear, bowing their heads in prayer, while still wearing their steel helmets. On October 29, 1944, amid the pillboxes of the Siegfried Line, and near an old Jewish cemetery, radio microphones and cap cameras captured the historic moment, a proud gathering of GIs singing and reciting Hebrew prayers. The fighting was so close that as they prayed, the Jewish GIs could hear artillery shells exploding. The medieval synagogue of Aiken had been destroyed years before. It was among the hundreds of Jewish temples attacked by rampaging mobs on Kristallnacht in 1938. But then even though the synagogue was a grim ruin and many of the city's Jewish citizens had been murdered, the words of the Jewish New Year service were heard again in Aiken. For a thousand years, in thy sight, but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night. The Rosh Hashanah service would, was broadcast the next day on the NBC radio network throughout the United States. And later the service was broadcast into Nazi Germany. It was the first time since the rise of Hitler that Hebrew prayers had been heard over German airwaves. The day after the ceremony, Paul had returned to the cemetery with the Jewish American lieutenant. In a large tomb, they found hundreds of rare Jewish religious books and Torahs, which they reasoned had been placed there by Aiken's Jewish leaders for safekeeping before the synagogue had been set ablaze. Paul stood amazed. 
many of the books were so fragile. They had to be 800 or 900 years old. A priceless library that Paul and the lieutenant were concerned might be destroyed in the shelling. Across the street was a Roman Catholic church and monastery. And Paul asked the mother superior if she would take all the religious books and hide them in the church. If the Nazis ever come back, she said in a whisper, they would cut off all our heads. But the mother superior was brave, she said, yes. Took Paul and the lieutenant half a day, but they managed to safely hide the sacred ancient Torahs and prayer books in the church. In the barracks at Stalag IXA, Paul was suffering, like all the other men, from the effects of starvation. But he never lost faith. He told Skip over and over that he was certain they would survive. Skip, we're going to celebrate Passover as free men. Still, even as he entertained thoughts about his life as a free man, he couldn't escape the image of Bobby or his increasing concern about the Jewish soldiers left behind at Bad Orb. At Stalag IXB SS, under Stumpfer Willie Hack, was intent on filling his work contingent of 350 Americans, Jewish or otherwise, and began to interrogate other soldiers, not only men with clearly Jewish surnames, like Private William Shapiro, a medic from the Bronx, but some who simply had Jewish-looking faces or Jewish-sounding names. Hack filled the quota with non-Jewish troublemakers and undesirables, like Private First Class Johann Karl Friedrich Kasten. When officers like Sieber and Hack continued to press, under threat of execution, for the remaining Jewish GIs, Kasten protested. Kasten was a very truesman, which means a man of confidence, one of 15 men of confidence the camp had elected to represent the enlisted soldiers before the camp's commandant. This was for the confidence of our men, not the Germans. I was the unlucky one to be elected. His fluency in German made him a natural choice. Born and raised in Hawaii, Kasten was a second generation German American. He had visited pre war Nazi Germany as a teenager, even personally met Adolf Hitler. But he was nonetheless a patriotic American who had enlisted in the U.S. infantry in 1943. He'd landed on Omaha Beach during D Day and had been captured during the Battle of the Bulge, fighting with the 28th Infantry Division. Kasten was summoned to a small second floor conference room where several German officers were waiting. There were eight chairs, and on a table in front of one of the chairs was a loaf of bread, very obviously a bribe for something coming. He took his seat, and the senior German officer demanded, Cousin, we want the names of all the Jews in the American camp. Without any hesitation, Kasten pushed the loaf of bread to the center of the table. We are all Americans. We don't differentiate by religion. Kasten was jerked out of his chair, thrown down a flight of stairs from the second floor. We're going to stop there for just a minute. This should have been the Tennessean.
telling this story. And remember, it's a true story. He lay in the street, trying to determine if any bones were broken. When he was finally able to stand badly bruised, he returned to the American sector of the camp and immediately summoned other men of confidence. He instructed all the leaders to return to their barracks and relay the story. With his final instructions, something's bound to happen and soon. None of the men should admit to being Jewish. Sure enough, that afternoon, the Germans ordered the entire camp out onto the parade ground. There were some 4,000 U.S. infantrymen with the 15 men of confidence in the front. The commandant stood on a small platform and shouted, Alle Juden in Schritt vorwärts, all Jews, one step forward. Because of my morning instructions, no one moved. This infuriated the officer to an extent that he jumped down from his platform, grabbed a rifle from one of the guards, and rushed towards me, Caston recalled. I was convinced he was going to shoot me, but instead holding the barrel, he swung the rifle like Babe Ruth, and with all his strength, he crashed the butt against my chest. I flew backwards about 15 feet and fell on the ground. I couldn't breathe. I thought I was done for. While Caston lay there dazed, the guards went through the ranks of men and pulled out any GIs who looked Jewish. Caston, see on Erden, Eden, assist in Nach. Caston, you and your two assistants also. Caston felt this was retribution for his having been frank with the inspectors from the Red Cross about the brutality and conditions at Bad Orb, as well as his refusal to turn over Jewish troops. Hack also took a 20-year-old Mexican-American from Southern California, a combat medic with the 257th Infantry Regiment, Private Tony Acevedo. Hack accused Acevedo of lying and spying against Germany in the northern Mexican state of Durango. Even though Acevedo was from San Bernardino, California, and had nothing to do with counterintelligence. Convinced that Acevedo was a spy, Hack ordered Acevedo's torture. They put needles in my fingernails, Acevedo later recalled. Like nailing me to the cross, still Acevedo wouldn't lie, wouldn't falsely confess. He was segregated with the men bound for the special work detail. The GIs who were taken from Bad Orb, Caston later recounted, were crammed into boxes as before. No food or water, four days to the town Berga and Dirt Elster. The POs, POWs soon saw that Berga was a slave labor concentration camp, totally against Geneva Convention rules for prisoners of war to be incarcerated in such a place. The Jewish men selected Morton Goldstein as their leader, but the Germans told them a Jew couldn't hold that position. So automatically I became the leader as a carryover from Stalag IXB. Very rapidly things went from bad to worse. The slave labor detail at Bergen, near Dresden, at Berga, comprised mostly of political prisoners and European Jews from concentration camps. 
was part of an emergency fuel program established on May 30, 1944, to transfer synthetic oil production deep underground in order to protect it from Allied bombing. Known as Schwab 5, the top secret project was under the immediate direction of Hack and entailed a massive construction zone of 17 different tunnels leading into a planned large factory area. Everything in Burga was under the supervision of the SS. Overnight, American infantrymen from the 28th and 106th Infantry Divisions, including Ernie Conoy, found themselves alongside prisoners from the Buchenwald concentration camp. In freezing and inhumane conditions, the GIs were forced to blast and hack out the tunnels, all the while inhaling large dust particulates which left most of them with lung ailments. Inside the Berger concentration camp, slave laborers <clears throat> endured constant mistreatment, starvation, and beatings by Willie Hack and his second-in-command, a fanatical SS guard named Erwin Metz. Their only meal was a weak soup made from weeds mixed with a dead cat or rat and a tiny portion of bread containing sawdust, ground grass, and sand. Only 100 grams of it per week. The European Jewish workers from Buchenwald were killed frequently from minor infractions or at the capricious whims of the SS. The American GIs were forced to watch the SS men execute them by beating and hanging. Under Hack's sadistic watch, the Americans were now also forced to be slave laborers alongside European Jews from concentration camps on the massive demolition project tasked with digging deep tunnels into the mountains along the bank of the White Elster River. Caston later wrote, The agony of it all soon became evident. We had to get up while it was still dark, march to the mines to dig the tunnels without food or water, and 12 hours breathing stone dust and hauling out carts loaded with stone. Very soon after arrival, the men started dying of exhaustion, malnutrition, and extremely harsh treatment. Private William Shapiro was, as a combat medic, spared from work in the mines but watched the gruesome and often fatal slave labor details each day. The work went on seven days per week. They were marched to the tunnel area, but a mile from our barracks by our guards. In the slave tunnels, they were under the command of the same work gang bosses and civilian engineers as the slave political prisoners from the concentration camp annex. Their work was identical to the political prisoners, but at a different shift time. The slave work consisted of excavating rocks and dirt by hand and shovel. It was loosened, after it was loosened, by the explosives. The men hand-loaded rocks onto or shoveled slate fragments and dirt onto flatbed cars, similar to coal cars. They hand-pushed the cars on its track to an area where the rocks could be dumped into the White Elster River. They worked with primitive drills, 
old mining machines, and often the men were utilized in place of machine power or horse power to move heavy objects. Fatal accidents and brutal beatings by the guards armed with rubber hoses were commonplace. Shapiro said, slate dust was choking every ever present. Our Volksturm guards marched the ship to POWs to their tunnels, where they remained until the shift ended. The return to the barracks was often marked by the indifference and uncaring long waiting periods till our guards arrived to march them back to the barracks in the Bronx. Even after the torture, there was a further delay of the much-deserved rest because they had to stand in line for the evening count of the prisoners. These repetitive, disruptive, inane counts made the suffering harsher. Finally, the meager rations of a bowl of rotted potato or turnip top green soup and a slice of hard grainy black bread was distributed. With his medical training, Shapiro did his best to tend to the sick and starving GIs, though he had no medical supplies. He wrote, It was very apparent to observe their progress of bodily deterioration and the loss of the will to continue to live was in their vacant staring into space. The exhausted movements and disinterest in their surroundings, which foretold the ultimate demise of many of them. Even when not being tormented by the SS men, Shapiro observed, our agony was worsened by supposed ordinary Germans Many of the overseers were men of the Volksturm, some as old as 70. These were grown men of age when Hitler came to power in Germany. They were older men who possessed the same mentality of the SS, even though they were the last resort of men to defend their country as home guard. They were conscripted for guard duty because of age and disabilities, yet their actions were equally barbaric as any Nazi. They didn't treat us as soldiers, but rather as political prisoners who had to suffer. Large measure of their brutality was of their own volition, as they were not under constant orders or surveillance by the superior officers. Beating the prisoners, hitting them with the butts of their rifles, were spontaneous expressions of their own individual bestial acts against mankind. Then there were the hangings of the European Jews in their telltale concentration camp uniforms with the yellow stars. The bodies of European Jews emaciated in their striped uniforms were left suspended from a robust crossbeam as warnings to other inmates. Author Roger Cohen wrote, Ernie Kinoy thought he'd seen hellish scenes before Battle of Bulge and a forced march and a bad orb. But it was nothing like the scenes at Berga. One winter day, Kanoi was selected by the SS men to leave the mines and go to the Berga concentration camp for supplies, then drag them back up the hill. It was backbreaking labor. He found himself standing in a yard as a Nazi sergeant started to beat a young Hungarian Jewish prisoner 
with a whip cross the street with three or four German women with baby carriages, Ken I recalled. The guard would scream at this 13-year-old kid, call him to attention, then viciously beat him again. And you could see these three or four ladies from the town standing there, continuing their discussion, watching this Nazi beat up this kid. And I've always found this that significant as a symbol in terms of what the German public did and didn't know about what was going on in the Holocaust. These ladies watched it all and didn't even once turn away. For the GIs condemned to Berga, death seemed almost assured. In time, they resigned themselves to it. Others seemed unbreakable, like Caston. Undaunted by the brutality, Caston wrote that he, quote, requested a meeting with Lieutenant Hack, accompanied by his assistant, Joe Little. He said, we made our point about the Geneva Convention rules that one day we would have to answer for his actions. Hack's answer was blunt. You were brought here to work and that's what you will do. Hack mockingly read aloud the GI's full name from his ID tags. Johann Karl Frederick Kasten. You're a German. You have come here to destroy the Third Reich. You know, Kasten, there's only one thing worse than a Jew. Do you know what that is? Kasten remained defiantly silent. It's a traitor who betrays his country. And you are a traitor. Hack turned his ferocious gaze to Private Joe Littell. Are you Jewish? Hack demanded. No, I'm a Christian, Littell said. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and Jesus was a Jew. Leave Jesus out of this, Hack shouted. William Shapiro spent almost every morning on breakfast detail, wheeling a heavy cart uphill and through the entrance of the concentration camp where European Jewish prisoners would ladle out the soup. On very harsh, blustery days, they would assign 10 men to the food detail. Adding more men to the detail was an opportunity in which we were able to assist some of our buddies in their escape from the camp. We'd try to confuse the guards by telling them that we only had eight men on the detail at the start, but in fact, we were 10 men. We would move about, changing positions on the wagon to confuse the guards into believing that there were eight of us. During the darkness of the morning beyond the lights of our camp, they would slip away from the detail. Several men escaped the camp this way. Once on early morning food patrol, Kasten, Littell, and another fluent German-speaking GI broke away from the guards. They were quickly recaptured and sent to Stalag IXC, where they were held in solitary confinement. Private Morton Goldstein of the 106th Division kept vowing to escape Nazi captivity. I'd met him in Stalag IXBN. He was a garrulous, bombastic man who could not be confined, certainly couldn't do the work in the tunnels. His first escape ended in recapture and extra duty, and he was forced to stand out in the cold for a long time. Around the third week of March, Goldstein made a second escape attempt. He was on the loose only for a few days before being recaptured. 
Sergeant Metz stood Goldstein against a wall and shot him, execution style, through the head. As his body lay on the ground in front of the other prisoners, German guards riddled him with bullets so that he could be classified as shot while trying to escape. Afterward, the Nazis would not allow his corpse to be moved. His body laid on a stretcher between two barracks as a warning to others. Shapiro wrote, the display of Gostin's body was to deter any further attempts to escape. The horrors of slave labor in Burga continued for weeks. Even when it became clear to the Nazi guards the war was likely lost. Berga was virtually the only POW camp in which American soldiers experienced brutality commensurate with Nazi concentration and death camps. Combat medic Tony Acevedo, who had weighed 149 pounds when he was captured, dropped down to a skeletal 87 pounds. Of the 350 young GIs to work at Berga, 73 men died in the space of 10 weeks. The fatality rate at Berga would prove to be the highest of any camp where POWs were held during World War II. Chapter 20. Stalag IXA, where Roddy and the other men had been transferred, was a sprawling older camp carefully divided into subcamps by nationality. The French, who'd been POWs since the fall of France in 1940, the British, many of whom had been captured at Dunkirk, the Serbians, the Soviet Red Army troops from the Eastern Front, treated much more brutally than any other captured nationality. Now the Americans, the newest arrivals who had been captured by the thousands since the Battle of the Bulls. The Stalag was strictly for non-coms of various nations and Roddy and the other GIs would quickly learn that the Germans had forced the defeated French to build it immediately after the Battle of France. Many of the French infantry sergeants and corporals had been prisoners for a full five years. Among these early POWs had been a young sergeant injured and captured by the Germans on June 14, 1940, Francois Mitterrand, who after the war would be elected president of the French Republic. By the time Roddy and the others transferred POWs arrived from Bad Orb, Mitterrand had escaped from Stalag IXA to join the resistance. The captured troops of the forces armées Francaise constituted the largest cohort of POWs in Stalag IXA. Given their five years in captivity, the French had developed a very well-organized camp civilization with a library, sports team, arts club, live theater, a symphony jazz orchestra, a choir, even a temporary university where various POWs delivered a series of lectures. The French had a functioning Roman Catholic church and six or seven priests among their POWs. 
By this late stage of the war, the American prisoners would have no access to such luxuries as musical instruments or sports equipment, nor would they receive sufficient food, not even Red Cross parcels, to have the energy to be physically active. All the Americans could see the French handwriting literally in their barracks. On the filthy walls were the phrases, defense de fumer, no smoking, and fermez port, close the door. As one American POW observed, Stalag IXA was a French camp in every sense of the word. The camp was laid out almost like a small town with buildings in a line on either side of a central street. On days when the ice thawed, the street turned a muddy slop. But just as at Bad Orb, barbed wire was everywhere. As Master Sergeant Roddy Edmonds was now the top-ranking infantryman in the camp, he was the non-com with the most seniority due to his enlistment date in the peacetime 1941 Army. But it was also evident to all the other corporals and sergeants that he knew how to look out for their best interests. Frankie wrote in his diary, Roddy Banal was our barracks leader. He got the job because he knew how to give good commands and he was a good soldier. Skip recalled, Roddy was a very stoic guy, very solid guy, and would take no garbage from anybody, particularly Germans. We were very lucky to have him with us. Each of the five American barracks in Stalag IXA had between 250 and 300 men. The overcrowding was not as bad as at Stalag IXB, but the barracks were equally as grim. Infested with vermin, dirty, dark, freezing, and barely habitable. There was a cold water tap, no toilet in the barracks, and a small stove that rarely had any fuel. Each man was given a thin blanket, but they still huddled together for warmth. Starving infantrymen crowded in the triple-tiered bunks, sleeping on thin burlap sack mattresses filled with straw. Two or three men shared each narrow bunk to keep from freezing during the night. First thing in the morning, the day after the Americans were transferred, the staff car of a Nazi officer arrived in Stalag, IXA. Word quickly spread that it was Major Siegman from the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht who had followed the non-coms from Bad Orb to Zingenheim. Abtun! The late afternoon, the camp loudspeakers boomed with these two guttural syllables, shattering the frozen silence of the stalag. Then after a long crackling pause, came the order, first in German, then in English. The Monomone at roll call. All Jewish Americans must assemble in the upper plats. That's the place where roll call is performed. Only the Jews, no one else. All who disobey this order will be shot. Roddy listened closely, along with Frankie Lester and the others in the barracks. Lester recalled, these were the same orders we'd received at Bad Orb. Only this time we were organized. 
Ronnie for the first time in this experience was in complete command. There was no one there to give him orders. It was his decision. Without hesitation, Roddy turned to his men and said, We're not doing that. Tomorrow we all fall out just as we do every morning. Then Roddy was silent. Frankie knew that Roddy would never comply with an illegal and immoral order. He was too good a soldier and too decisive a leader. But how could Roddy defy the Germans without putting everyone's life at risk? Roddy was deep in thought. He was most likely praying and recalling a favorite Bible verse, as he often did in life. I know that his favorite passage in all of this scripture was Romans 8.37. Yet in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. How could 1,292 malnourished, frostbitten men suddenly be transformed into conquering lions? Any defiant action he might take could be potentially deadly. Not just for the Jewish GIs, but for every single infantryman in the camp. There was a simple solution, but risky. Ronnie called a meeting of all barracks leaders, several of the most senior sergeants gathered around Ronnie's bunk as three other non-coms stood as lookouts at the door and the windows. We're not doing it, Roddy said. Every infantryman, he told them, would assemble in strict military formation at the Apple Platz at the next morning's roll call. Every soldier, even those named McCoy and Walker, Smith, Nicholson, Miller, and Bruno, would tell the Germans that they were Jewish. Roddy made clear that everyone must follow his order. All infantrymen, every single one of the 1,292 men in camp. He stressed that even the men too sick and weak to walk could not be left behind in the barracks. Every man must assemble in the apple plats because the stakes were so high. Roddy couldn't afford any misunderstanding or inadvertent acts of disobedience. He ordered all the barracks leaders to make sure every man in the camp understood the plan. After nightfall, once the windows of the American barracks were shuttered, Lester awoke with a start. The words of the loudspeaker announcement kept replaying in his mind. Tomorrow morning at roll call, all Jewish Americans must assemble in the Apple Platz. Only the Jews, no one else. All who disobey this order will be shot. A few bits of straw dislodged from the mattress above him fell slowly like snowflakes and rested on his hollowed chest. He flicked the straw away with the back of his hand. Better than the lice, he thought that hopped constantly between their bodies, was still nearly pitch black inside the barracks, and it felt like 10 degrees below freezing. He cupped the steam of his warm breath in his numb fingers, then looked over at Roddy, barely two feet away. In the dim light, he could see that his master sergeant was quietly praying. The wicked flee 
when no man pursues, Roddy prayed. But the righteous are bold as a lion. Lester walked, watched, that is, as Frankie pressed tight against Roddy, also started stirring. None of the three sergeants could sleep. Frankie's shock of thick, black, curly hair had grown wilder and matted during recent weeks. Short, but once powerfully muscled, Frankie was by now emaciated, his cheekbones jutting. He'd lost 30 pounds since his capture after the ferocious fighting around St. Vit. Roddy gripped Frankie lightly, perhaps feeling his bunkmate's shoulder bone pressing hard against the fabric of his filthy fatigues. Now you're positive. Everyone knows, Frankie. Lester could hear the urgency in Roddy's voice. Yep. All five barracks. Everyone, yep. Yeah. Told them all again that all other staff sergeants, all barrack chiefs, and the guy too sick to walk. Lester saw Frankie nodding resolutely. Even the guys too sick to walk. On January 27th, at precisely 0600, with the bark of Rios, Rios, there was a sudden banging on the barracks doors. Frankie and Lester hustled the men outside. The hard-packed snow crunched under their shuffling boots. Roddy glanced back to see if all the men were there, as the barracks leaders had promised. Standing next to him were Tannenbaum and Stern. Nearby were Serenzia and Friedman. The men were assembled as planned. Even those too sick to walk were doing their best to stand up straight in formation. A few were having trouble leaning heavily on other POW shoulders, but they were forming up in ranks. Roddy had faith. Faith in God, faith in his fellow infantrymen. He knew they wouldn't betray their brothers in arms, not there voluntarily. But he also knew that starvation and desperation could play games with men's minds. He was starving and exhausted in terrible pain, nearly physically and emotionally beaten. He started to worry about his and his men's resolve. What if a single starving soldier decided to save his own skin by pointing out the Jews in the ranks. What if the plan didn't work? He tried to steal himself. One of his favorite scripture passages, which he loved to quote throughout his life, was John 15, 13. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Suddenly, Major Siegman approached the Avoplatz. As he got closer, Roddy could see his face clearly, his blue eyes scanning the ranks of men in the Avoplatz, his black polished boots gleaming in the morning light. What is los? Is das in wits? A joke? The Major no doubt had expected to see a smattering of G Jewish GIs, or maybe a couple hundred, just like the selection back at Bad Orb, and could scarcely believe his eyes. The entire American camp, all 1,292 U.S. prisoners, 
stood lined up in sharp formation. He stormed directly toward Roddy and shouted in English, What's this? Roddy held his strict posture, jaw fixed, looking straight ahead. Under Article 17 of the Geneva Convention, prisoners of war are only required to provide name, rank, and serial number. The Major approached to within striking distance of Roddy. Were my orders not clear, Sergeant? Only the Jews were to fall out. On his immediate left, Roddy could see Lester and on his right, Paul. Though they were both clearly terrified, like Roddy, they kept up stoic expressions. Major, we'll give you name, rank, and serial number, and that's all. Only the Jews! They cannot all be Jews, Sigmund shouted. Roddy turned to stare the Major directly in the eyes. We are all Jews here, Roddy said. Roddy's defiance spread throughout the ranks. A sense of unified strength coursed through the starving, weakened POWs, who at this point barely resembled soldiers. Hearing their leader's calm resolve emboldened them again. Roddy's words and actions seemed to give every infantryman in the camp courage. Not a single soldier broke ranks, faltered or flinched. Stepping forward, Siegmund drew his Luger from his holster. Sergeant, one last chance, he said as he pressed the barrel of the pistol hard against Roddy's forehead right between his eyes. You will order the Jews to step forward, or I will shoot you right now. Roddy stood his ground. There was a long silence between them. No words, no gestures, only the swirling gusts of snow and the smoke-like puffs of their frozen breath dissipating skyward. At last, Roddy replied calmly, Major, you can shoot me, but you'll have to kill all of us because we know who you are and you will be tried for war crimes when we win this war and you will pay. The Major's face blanched. His arm trembled. The Luger was still pressed to Roddy's head, his finger still on the trigger. Then quickly, enraged, Sigmund snapped the pistol back to his side, holstered it, turned on his boot heel, and fled the compound. Part 5. The Opposite of Love isn't hate, it's indifference. Eli Weasel. Chapter 21. Lester recalled the mood of elation in the barracks after Roddy's confrontation with Sigmund. We went back to the barracks and really cheered Roddy. He never wavered. What, what he did made us brave. I was very proud. I was happy, but Roddy didn't want to talk about it. He was facing the enemy at the risk of his life, and what he did was to save us. He thought only of his men, and that takes courage. But that was Roddy. We all came to admire and respect him so that when Roddy said something while we were prisoners, that is what we did. But all the POWs, Jewish and non-Jewish, remained in constant peril. 
every day brought the risk of death, freezing, starving, being shot by a German guard for some minor infraction. The fear was ever present that the high command would make yet another attempt to remove the Jews. Roddy realized the desperation of the moment. And he recognized that his most immediate challenge was to restore a sense of military discipline to the ranks of GIs in Stalag IXA. He had seen the demoralization and despair caused at Bad Orb. The way we were mixed in rank and representing three or four infantry divisions. There wasn't much organization. To tell you the truth, military discipline sort of went to hell in that first prison. Our officers were being treated like GIs, given no way to exert any influence for our betterment. The non-commissioned officers were without authority and this led to a certain degree of slovenlessness. In a page of his diary, Frankie Sorenza wrote of the deteriorating morale and the behavior among the American POWs. Only a small handful have managed to hang on to their pride and self-respect. Many of the men had stooped to everything but murder over a spoonful of soup or a crumb of bread. Stealing is simply terrible, and if you manage to save anything for the next day, you got to sleep on it in order to hang it, hang, hang on to it that long. It's awful to see a once carefree and reckless American hunk of humanity stooped to a form of animal. I pray God to keep me strong in mind and body, and I thank him for keeping me this long. In late January, Roddy realized that in addition to faith and prayer, the non-commissioned officers would need a new sense of military discipline to keep the men sane to curb the cutthroat survival at all cost impulses of some of the more desperate among them. The 250 to 300 men in each barracks organized themselves into groups of 50 with the highest ranking sergeant as the leader and Roddy in overall command as the ranking non-com. They took the initiative to create a staff consisting of six master and first sergeants. Each of the six was given an area of responsibility, health and sanitation, food supply, military discipline, and maintaining a chain of command. Lester said he knew by heart the precise and detailed regulations for soldiers taken prisoner by the enemy, which are taught at the U.S. Army Infantry School in Fort Benning. Roddy was also well acquainted with those rules. If I'm captured, I remain a soldier. I'm guided by the code of conduct and subject to the Uniform Code of Military Justice. I'm entitled to protection under the provisions of the Geneva Convention. I will take no part in any action which might be harmful to my comrades. And more to this point, I will make every effort to escape and aid others to escape. I must be prepared to take advantage of escape opportunities whenever they rise. POWs must organize in a military manner under the senior person eligible for command and the senior person shall assume command. Strong leadership is essential to survival 
and non-commissioned officers will continue to carry out their responsibilities and exercise their authority in captivity. Camaraderie and faith were crucial. But leaders like Roddy and the other ranking non-coms realized there was also a need for intellectual stimulation. For the most part, we were almost as bored as we were hungry, Sonny Fox wrote. The men organized a camp lecture circuit. Sonny and four other impresarios took an inventory among the POWs to see who could speak on intellectually stimulating topics. We turned up a ranger from a Yellowstone National Park and the editor of the Bisbee AZB. We organized a speaker's tour from barrack to barrack. We would announce the schedule in the barracks and pick a location among the bunk beds for each discourse. The lectures attracted any number from a few to as many as a hundred. In a camp of nearly 1,300 non-coms, there were young infantrymen with diverse experiences from their civilian lines. One man had worked for the district attorney's office in New York City and regaled us for many days about the mob activities there. Richard Peterson wrote, It's so interesting that he must have been giving us classified information. In the camp by one soldier's account, there was also a New York Broadway producer and an Ivy League history professor. By far the most popular were the talks given by men who knew how to cook, particularly one young restaurateur from Ohio. We even had cooking lectures in the barracks given by John Barbo, our little mess sergeant. Frankie wrote in his diary, he's a swell guy. You can't help but like him. He's short and stocky with very sunny disposition. P.O.W. David Dennis recalled, you might imagine what happened. After several sessions, the attendance at all, but the restaurant owner's session dwindled down to a few hard cases. The rest of us, some two or three hundred, listened rapidly to Johnny Barbeau. Funny how I can remember those details. Started out well telling us some of the funny or interesting anecdotes connected with this restaurant service, but it soon degenerated into questions from the floor such as, what was on your menu? Or, how do you cook corned beef? The floodgates then opened and everyone, I mean everyone, asked questions like, how about steak sandwiches? Or, did you ever serve Skippy's peanut butter? Or remember a bowl of Wheaties crammed with heavy cream and sugar? Everyone wanted to talk about his dream because that's all we could do about our never ending hunger. Sunny Fox wrote that in those moments. Recipes began to sound like poetry. We got used to being hungry, Paul Stern said. It's hard to explain what it was like when you're starved. You went to bed hungry, you got up hungry. You were hungry forever. Food was all we talked about. We listed all the foods we could eat if we could just get back home. Indeed, some of the POWs literally took pages of their journals to compile such lists. Pete Frampton remembered the lecture of one soldier with a background as an architect 
who helped us build dream castles for our future civilian life. Frank and Ronnie chatted for hours in the gloomy barracks. Ronnie and I have spent time together discussing expenses for building a small home, Frankie wrote in his diary. We came to the conclusion that both of us had a sufficient amount of money or would have, upon liberation, to furnish a very comfortable apartment. But very soon, in their stay at Stalag IXA, a prospective business venture flew around the camp grapevine. Johnny has big plans for opening a restaurant when he gets home. Frankie wrote one day, he's the talk of the camp. He and Roddy are going into partnership, and Roddy, being an ex-sign painter, is drawing up all his plans. Roddy and the Stavon POWs dreamed of fine food and one day eating at the Jolly Chef. A desperate man has a chance of staying alive if he has a hope of a future. Roddy wrote in his journal, decided on restaurant business Thursday 15th, February 45. Definitely decided on restaurant business Friday the 16th, February 45. Planning restaurants like the Jolly Chef gave their lives in captivity purpose. They would resist starvation just as they defied the Nazis. Till liberation came, they would gorge themselves from imaginary menus. On a bright winter morning, the Germans brought in a new group of British soldiers who looked more dead than alive. By the time they reached Falag IXA, the British non-coms had been on the road for some 60 days, forced march from deep in the eastern part of Germany. Some had no boots or shoes, only cloths wrapped around their frozen feet. Dirt caked their faces and bodies. Their clothing was filthier than ours, wrote Richard Peterson. Word spread throughout the camp that these British prisoners had been marched in savage conditions. Many had died along the route, either from illness or exposure or being shot. Watching the British soldiers' painful progress to the open fields at the rear of the camp, Peterson wrote, we realize it could happen to us as well. This terrifying group of British prisoners brought in their news as well. The fate of those GIs segregated at Bad Orb in the Jewish barracks. P.O.W. Jane Kelch wrote in his diary, British prisoners arrive from Breslau, men from Bad Orb, forced to work in mines. Though still a rumor, it was the first indication that something awful had happened to the privates and Private's first class back at Bad Orb. What did exactly did it mean for those 350 taken from Bad Orb for the special work camp of SS Lieutenant Willie Hack? Forced to work in mines. The phrase sounded ominous. But Jewish GIs like Lester, Paul, and Skip still had no idea how grim a fate they had so narrowly escaped. The degree of camaraderie and assistance provided to the GIs 
by their French allies, proved invaluable, having spent so much time behind barbed wire, some more than five years. The French infantrymen in the adjacent compound were immeasurably better adapted to life under Nazi captivity. Most important to the Americans, the French were regularly receiving parcels from the International Red Cross in Geneva. Recalled Richard Peterson, the French looked in good shape physically and they were willing to give or lend some of the Red Cross parcels. The food contained in these parcels sustained the prisoners of war in the German camps. The normal Red Cross issue was one per man per month, but the American POWs only received one during their time in Ziegenheim. They welcomed the contents of the boxes donated by the French. We received our first Red Cross package today. Frankie wrote in his diary on February 8th, although it was a one-man box, we had to share four men to a box. But what a joy. Inside was five packages of smokes, a two-pound can of oleomargarine, two cans of sardines, a box of prunes, box of biscuits, a full can of cocoa, can of good coffee, can of powdered milk, sugar, jelly, meat, cheese, and so forth. The French, in those early weeks of captivity, also provided another crucial source of hope to the GIs, news from the front lines. Sonny Fox maintained that his later broadcasting career began with his announcing in the darkness of the Stalag IXA barracks, military news translated from the French. The French POWs had managed to rig a radio. Sonny wrote, they would listen to the communiques from the BBC, and then each day they would recite them to one of our men who understood French at the point where our compound fences touched. He in turn would translate the communiques from both fronts for the five of us who would then be responsible for presenting them each night in our barracks. At six o'clock at night, we would put someone at the door so that if a German guard was coming in, I could switch to a lecture on something innocuous. Then I would, by memory, describe what was happening on the Western and Eastern fronts. Only through reports on the BBC did the American POWs learn that the Battle of the Bulge had been an enormous, enormously costly victory for the Allies, and that even though the men had been captured and were behind barbed wire, they'd played a crucial role in foiling Hitler's counteroffensive to drive to Antwerp. One particularly grim BBC broadcast had been picked up by French radio and the news of it reverberated among all the nationalities. On January 27th, 1945, the same day that Roddy had risked his life by standing up to Major Sigmund, the Soviet Union had marched through the gates of the largest and most infamous of the Nazi factories of death. The following day, the BBC had announced, the Red Army has liberated the Nazis' biggest concentration camp at Auschwitz. 
in southwestern Poland. According to reports, hundreds of thousands of Polish people, as well as Jews from a number of other European countries, have been held prisoner there in appalling conditions, and many have been killed in the gas chambers. Details of what went on at the camp have been released previously by Polish government in exile in London and for prisoners who have escaped. In July 1944, details were revealed of more than 400,000 Hungarian Jews who were sent to Poland, many of whom ended up in Auschwitz. They were loaded onto trains and taken to the camp where many were put to death in the gas chambers. Before they went, they were told they were being exchanged in Poland for prisoners of war and made to write cheerful letters to relatives at home telling them what was happening. According to the Polish Ministry of Information, the gas chambers are capable of killing 6,000 people a day. Since its establishment in 1940, only a handful of prisoners have escaped to tell the full horror of the camp. In October last year, a group of Polish prisoners mounted an attack on their German guards. The Germans reportedly machine gunned the barrack barracks, killing 200 Polish prisoners. The Poles succeeded in killing six of their executioners. When the Red Army arrived at the camp, they found only a few thousand prisoners remaining. They'd been too sick to leave. The scale of the Nazi factories of genocide was staggering. Historians today estimate that at minimum 1.3 million people were deported to Auschwitz between 1940 and 1945, and of these at least 1.1 million were murdered. Roddy and the other GIs in Stalag IXA didn't yet know the full extent of the Nazi desperation to hold on to their skeletal prisoners. In mid-January 1945, as the Soviet troops and tanks approached the Auschwitz camp complex, the SS began evacuating Auschwitz and its satellite camps. The BBC had announced that the German guards had been given orders to destroy the crematoria and the gas chambers, and the prisoners who were able to walk were forced to march to other camps in Germany. More than 6,000 prisoners marched west toward the city of Wazala Slusky in the western part of Upper Silesia in Poland and ultimately toward other concentration camps still functioning in Nazi Germany. Anyone who fell behind anyone too weak to continue marching was shot. Prisoners also succumbed to the bitter cold weather, starvation, and exposure on those marches. More than 15,000 died during the death marches from Auschwitz. When they weren't surreptitiously following the news reports of frontline action and the growing sense of Nazi crimes against humanity, Roddy and the other POWs in Stalag IXA were simply trying to stay sane. The weeks of malnutrition were changing their bodies and their minds in an unexpected way. Sunny 
wrote this physiological fact about starvation is that it reduces the functions of the male glands and enhances those that are more female-like. Sonny wrote that, adding that the men's facial hair had turned softer and our voices went up in pitch. A grim joke spread through us, Dalek IXA. If Rita Hayworth walked into our barracks naked, carrying a corned beef sandwich, there'd be over 200 guys clawing and kicking and trying to kill each other just to get a bite of that sandwich. In the pitifully inadequate camp infirmary, men were being admitted daily, suffering from jaundice and full-blown starvation. In early March 1945, the POWs were joined by medical officer named Captain Stanley E. Morgan. Originally from New Orleans, Captain Morgan had been a POW for six months when he was transferred to Stalag IXA. An Air Corps officer in the 101st Airborne Division, Morgan didn't live in the barracks with the NCOs, but was a welcomed addition to the camp leadership. Pete Frampton recalled, Captain Morgan answered medical questions that were on the minds of all of us. Things like, how long can we keep going on rations like these? Six months of this would be about the limit. The poor guy didn't have any medicine to offer us, but he encouraged us in many other ways. Captain Morgan had neither medical instruments nor drugs. Initially, he didn't even have hospital beds, but he worked out of the office of the American Man of Confidence, a sergeant named Elmer Kraske. Born in Detroit, Kraske served with the 179th Infantry. 45th Division was captured on January 3rd, 1945, near Wingen in northern France and transferred to Stalag IXA on January 27, 1945, same day that Roddy had his con confrontation with Major Siegmund. Serving as the man of confidence was often thankless. The POW liaison would spend his days interacting with the Commandant's staff in a fruitless attempt to negotiate better rations, more cigarettes, and improved living conditions. Frankie Serenzia grew close to Kraske and wrote in his journal that Ruddy also came to be very friendly with him. Frankie added, most times, Kraske is expected to do things which are literally impossible, although he tries his utmost to do the impossible, he rarely succeeds, and then he has to put up with all kinds of abuse. Kraske was granted a small office by the Germans and told Frankie he needed an assistant, officially the chief clerk. For the, Amer for the American section of Stalag IXA. I eagerly accepted chiefly because I craved something to keep my mind occupied, Frankie wrote. Beyond the POW's dire medical conditions, starvation, frostbite, trench foot, and other diseases, there was also the psychological abyss. Some men had given up all hope of liberation. 
The look was unmistakable in their hollowed eyes and skeletal cheeks. They were slowly drifting away, somewhere between daydreams, sleep, and death. They'd lost the will to continue, even one more day. Corporal Russell Gunnelfus, Gunnelfusson of the 590th Field Artillery Battalion recalled the constant conversations in the barracks about survival. You're almost ready to give up because of your weakened condition. That's what Germany wanted. The night of that walk from the railroad station to the camp, the German army probably wishing half of us would have died. Then they wouldn't have to feed us, you know. You don't have to feed a dead man. Self-harm wasn't openly talked about, but some POWs did privately contemplate ending their lives. I thought about suicide in my most despairing times, contemplating our open-ended prison sentence, wrote Richard Peterson. Doubt about the winner of the race between our liberators and the limited capacity of our bodies to tolerate privation tormented me. Ronnie recognized this insidious internal danger. He knew that once a man lost the will to live, he was a goner. Once he gave up faith, only slow death from disease and starvation awaited him. Roddy issued an order that the strongest of his NCOs, what he called the up guys, tend to their comrades nearest death the down guys. They helped the weak and hopeless to their feet each morning, got the blood circulating in their freezing legs, forced them to consume the few calories in the black sawdust bread. They urged them to think of home, their parents, sisters, brothers, girlfriends, to visualize the day fast approaching, when the Nazi criminals would face stern justice and the Sherman tanks would be rolling through the front gates of the Stalag. Receiving news from the front was so vitally important that Roddy ordered the Americans to build their own radio. Roddy, being the communications chief for our HQ company, knew the value of a radio. The radio we had in the POW camp was put together by the radio men who had been trained by the army for that job, from parts smuggled into the camp by the volunteers who went to work in the town of Ziegenhain, ostensibly as a gesture to the German people, but actually planned to obtain information and any materials that could be brought back to camp. NCOs and Stalag IXA were not obliged to work for the Germans, but volunteer work parties were organized daily under a parole system. Sometimes the Germans offered an incentive, as Frankie wrote, of 10 cigarettes, an extra one-sixth of slice of bread, or ration of soup. Lester recalled Ronnie's thinking, we needed a radio, but it would be too large to hide the clothing of these men. So the component parts had to be small enough to be concealed quickly, so they could be assembled back in camp and hidden during the barrack inspections by the guards. The radio surreptitiously assembled in Roddy's barracks 
allowed for more direct monitoring of the approaching Allied armies. Frankie wrote in his diary, February 23rd, 1945, was a big day for us. We'd been patiently looking forward to the Allies starting a big drive in the West to cross the Rhine and begin the final phase of the war. The day had happened. The big drive had finally started and was meeting with success. Now everyone was in high spirits again. From the end of February, the men regularly gathered around the makeshift radio to track updates about General Patton and his rapid advance through Germany. Itching to go on the attack, Patton defied General Eisenhower's strategy of aggressive defense and kept moving towards the Rhine with a low profile. He told his staff that the Third Army was going to carry out an armored reconnaissance using seven divisions. Roddy and the other men listened as Patton's Third Army tore through this same terrain where the 106th Division had fought, crossing the Schnee Eiffel's three major rivers, which were swollen by the snow and rains of the worst winter in 38 years, before capturing the cities of Prum and Bitburg by March 1st. They captured Trier a day later. Eisenhower and his staff at Schaefe had estimated it would take four full divisions to break the heavy Nazi resistance and capture Trier, but Patton sent Ike a sarcastic message. Have taken Trier with two divisions. Do you want me to give it back? At last, Patton received the command from General Omar Bradley, he'd long been waiting for. He was given full authority to move at a lightning pace and take the Rhine on the run. On March 7th, the intact Ludendorff Bridge at Remagen was captured by the First Army, and on March 10th, Patton's 4th Armored Division reached the Rhine River just to the north of Koblenz. Patton's forces had advanced a stunning 55 miles in less than two days. By March 22nd, Patton had eight divisions massed along the Rhine from Koblenz to Ludwigshafen. Patton's campaign west of the Rhine was over. The general made sure that Third Army engineers were ready with pontoon bridges so his forces could cross the river before Montgomery. And early on March 23rd, six battalions were over the river with a loss of only 28 men killed and wounded. Well, other infantry and engineer units had crossed just to the north at Nierstein without any opposition. After heavy Luftwaffe raids on the Third Army pontoon bridges during the day, Patton called Bradley. For God's sake, tell the world we're cr across. I want the world to know Third Army made it before Monty. At Bradley's headquarters that morning, the announcement was made that the Third Army had crossed the Rhine at 10 p.m. on March 22nd, quote, without benefit of aerial bombing, ground smoke, artillery preparation, and airborne assistance. On the day his first troops crossed the Rhine, Patton issued his now famous general order number 70 
to the Third Army and its supporting XYIX Tactical Air Command. The period from January 29th to March 22nd, 1945, you have rested 6,484 square miles of territory from the enemy. You've taken 3,072 cities, towns, and villages, including among the former Trier, Koblenz, Bingen, Worms, Mainz, Kaiserslautern, and Ludwig Schaefen. You've captured 140,112 enemy soldiers and have killed or wounded an additional 99,000, thereby eliminating practically all of the German 7th and 1st Armies. History records no greater achievement in so limited a time. The world rings with your praises. Better still, General Marshall, General Eisenhower, and General Bradley have all personally commended you. The highest honor I've ever attained is that of having my name coupled with yours in these great events. The following day at Oppenheim, Patton crossed the Rhine on a pontoon bridge. Halfway across, looking down into the mighty river, he opened his trousers to express himself in the Rhine. I've been looking forward to this for a long time, he wrote in his diary. Then I picked up some dirt on the far side in emulation of William the Conqueror. Patton's act of contempt was done in full view of his men and news cameras. I have expressed myself into the Rhine, he wrote Eisenhower. For God's sake, send some gasoline. Roddy and the other POWs celebrated Patton's seemingly unstoppable momentum. We've learned that General George Patton has captured 70,000 Germans, Cologne has fallen, the Rhine has been crossed in a number of places, and in three very important places that we know of, Cologne, Koblenz, and Dusseldorf, Frankie wrote in his diary. At night and all day, we can very clearly hear the battle sounds of artillery. Our boys aren't over 85 miles away from here. Every single day we can see or hear thousands of our planes flying into the very heart of Germany and laying many noisy eggs. By April 5th, I expect to be eating good army chow till I burst. And by the middle of May, I expect the most hated nation in the world to be crushed completely. I hope and pray I'm right. And that's it. Oh. To be at war is no picnic. Patton himself said war is hell. Couldn't have expressed it better. I so salute every veteran. Thank you for your service. You're beyond words. Great and mighty people. No matter how afraid you were at any time. And that's true of the Vietnam War, the Korean War. Any war we've fought, it takes such courage, more than I have. And I freely admit it, but I'm very, very, very proud of you.